Jeremy Kozmeroff. Uh, he's the managing editor of Covert Action Magazine. He's written four books on US foreign policy, including The Russians Are Coming Again, The First Cold War as Tragedy, The Second as Farce with John Marciano. And I do wanna say also say hi to John who is having some health issues, but John is a great guy, a friend of mine. And uh, Jeremy, are you on? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. And yeah, this a book may interest people. Uh, and um, yeah, unfortunately, John is in ill health as he was supposed to be here as well. But yeah, th this uh, our book, The Russians Are Coming Again, yeah, is definitely written in the revisionist tradition uh, that was being discussed before. Uh, and I think makes a you know very strong case and you know links the horrors of the first Cold War with the new Cold War. And I think, you know, we're living through the same paranoia. Uh, actually, we start the book with, uh, you know, the Academy Award winning film 1966, which some of you may be aware of. The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming, directed by Norman Jewison, parody parodies this Cold War paranoia then pervading the United States, depicting the chaos that seizes a small coastal New England town after a Soviet submarine runs aground. Half a century later, Americans are again, you know, we thought we're past that era, but for the last five years at least, we've been again warned daily of the Russian menace with persistent accusations of Russian aggression, lies, violations of international law, and cyber attacks on US elections, as reported in leading uh, supposedly liberal outlets like the New York Times and Washington Post and CNN, among others. Uh, the charges are many and relentless and include alleged poisoning, assassinations, bounties on US soldiers, uh, like all propaganda, there may be some grain of truth to some of the charges, but most of the allegations are unfounded and appear to be uh, untrue. The consequences, though, have been severe. A new Gallup poll finds that just 22% of U.S. citizens view Russia favorably, while 72% hold unfavorable views towards it, which is a huge difference from about 15 years ago when most Americans had a, a positive view of Russia at the end of the Cold War. Uh, Democrats troublingly hold particular hostility towards Russia with fewer than mm -hmm. one in six uh, telling Gallup they maintain positive opinions about the country as opposed to 25% of Republicans and 24% of independents. Uh, these totals indicate a high level of social conditioning whose end result could be war. And uh, there's a parallel, I think, with World War I and the uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, orchestrated propaganda campaigns against Germany, as well as in the first Cold War, where social conditioning uh, led to the fear about the Soviet Union that was greatly unfounded you know, after World War II, especially in considering that the Soviet Russia had been devastated, uh, leading the charge against Nazi Germany and su uh, suffered 27 million casualties. Yet many Americans believe that Russia was going to start a new war, which was uh, totally fanciful, uh, given the context. But to understand, I think, the danger of what we're facing, we, we are living through a very uh, dangerous period in history right now with very reckless leadership uh, in both parties, uh, evident in these recent statements of Joe Biden. Uh, to understand the danger of the new Cold War, it is necessary to reexamine the original conflict between the United States and the USSR. The present Russia panic falls an entire century of fear mongering and threat inflation dating to the Russian Revolution that has long served the interests of the US military industrial complex and security state. It has little to do with either Russian or American realities, which have been consistently distorted. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev said uh, that the Cold War, you know, this was perhaps the best synopsis uh, of the Cold War, was given by Gorbachev, the Soviet premier, who said, the Cold War made losers of us all. Uh, the losers included, uh, you know, the people in Korea and Vietnam uh, who died in the uh, millions, uh, third world countries which were destabilized. Uh, the losers included Americans uh, with the militarization of the US political economy, the threat of nuclear war, environmental uh, catastrophes bred by nuclear weapon development, and abuses of civil liberties. As Karl Marzani, an Office of Strategic Services and State Deployment employee, uh, described in his book, We Can Be Friends, he was a, vic a victim of McCarthyism. Uh, he said the Cold War threw the United States into semi-hysteria 
and a manufactured war psychosis with dog tags on children, airplane spotters on 24 hour duty, roads marked for quick evacuations, buildings designated as air raid shelters, air raid drills everywhere in streets, stores, and schools. Uh, the Cold War uh, also devastated, as we know, whole communities of leftist organizers and union uh, members from the McCarthyite witch hunts to the mass persecution of political radicals by US client states in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, few Americans today realize that it was the United States that first ignited these hostilities by invading Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. The Woodrow Wilson administration sent 10,000 US troops from the European theater of the First World War alongside the British, French, Canadians, and Japanese to aid the white generals, counter-revolutionary generals uh, tied with the morally bankrupt Zara system uh, who were implicated in wide scale atrocities in this war, including uh, perpetuating pogroms against Jews, which the Zarist regime had uh, perpetuated uh, for decades before. Uh, many Americans who fought were horrified by what they were doing, just like in the Vietnam War. Uh, one Lieutenant Colonel Robert Eichelberger said, the atrocities of the US allies would have been shameful in the Middle Ages. Uh, the memoirs, you have US soldiers in this uh, ill-fated mission uh, were similar to uh, memoirs of US soldiers in the Vietnam War. And yeah, I have one poem I could read uh, in Russia's field, uh, modeled after the famous First World War poem, Flanders Field. Uh, in Russia's field, no poppies grow. There are no crosses row on row to mark the places where we lie. No lark so grayly singing fly as in the fields of Flanders. We are the dead. Not long ago, we fought beside you in the snow. They were fighting in Siberia and gave our lives. And here we lie though scarcely knowing reason why, like those who died in Flanders. And you know uh, this war was carried out illegally uh, without the consent of Congress and was opposed by the uh, US Army commander uh, of, of the troops in Siberia, General William S. Graves, a Texan, who expressed doubt if history will record in the past century a more flagrant case of flouting the well-known and approved practice in states and their international relations and using instead of the accepted principles of international law, the principle of might makes right. Uh, unfortunately, these events are hardly recorded in our history textbook. There was uh, that book lie my teachers told me found that it was rarely mentioned in any uh, history textbook uh, given to high school students. And if it was mentioned, it was mentioned in a distorted way. Uh, the historian D.F. Fleming, who wrote a good history of the Cold War, wrote that for the American people, the cosmic tragedy of the intervention in Russia does not exist or was an unimportant incident long forgotten. But for the Soviet people and their leaders, the period was a time of endless killing, looting and raping, of plague and famine, of measureless suffering for scores of millions, and experience burn into the very soul of the nation, not to be forgotten for many generations, if ever. Also, for many years, the harsh Soviet regimentation could all be justified by fear that the capitalist power would be back to finish the job. It is not strange that in an address in New York, September 17, 1959, Premier Khrushchev should remind us of the intervention, the time you sent the troops to quell the revolution, as he put it. Uh, the Bolshevik drive, the main basis for this intervention was economic. The Bolshevik drive to nationalize industry and seize foreign assets was ideological and economic anathema to the US capitalist ruling elite. Uh, the US in 1917 held investments of over $658 million in Russia were at stake with the Russian revolution. The economic basis of, of, for opposing communism gets lost in much commentary about the history of the Cold War and most uh, academic scholarship ignores it. Uh, but it's really central, and I, I appreciate what Dan Ellsberg was discussing, uh, the central uh, role of lobbyists and special economic interests in driving forward uh, these war scares and wars. Uh, after World War II, one of the key architects of the Cold War was W. Avril Harriman, who happened to be the mentor of Joe Biden when Joe Biden was first elected to the U.S. Senate. Harriman was the son of E.H. Harriman, one of the original robber barons, who made his fortune in the railroads and was a founder of the legendary Wall Street investment firm Brown Brothers Harriman, which had German Nazi financiers as some of its clients. 
Uh, also, most significantly for our purpose, Brown Brothers Harriman had considerable investments in zinc mines in Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which were nationalized when the communists took over. Uh, this was the basis for Harriman's vendetta. He took the, the Bolshevik government to court. He got some settlement, but uh, he lost millions of dollars uh, when his mines were taken over by the Russian government. And this fueled a lifelong hatred for communism by him and others in his class. Uh, Harriman served as US ambassador to Moscow at the end of World War II. Uh, according to FDR's son, James Roosevelt, FDR uh, was a strong leader as uh, Peter's talk underscored. Uh, FDR was very smart, uh, visionary leader who stood up to anti-Russia hawks like Harriman in the State Department and promoted a peaceful policy towards Russia, evident at the Alta Conference, which Henry Wallace was intent on uh, continuing. However, due to those shenanigans Peter described, Wallace was removed from office and Harry Truman took over. Truman, as we know, was a provincial who was easily malleable and allowed Harriman and his associates and the aerospace industry to have free reign. And the result was the Cold War. Uh, Harriman came to direct the Marshall Plan, one of whose main intentions was to isolate Russia and undermine communism in Europe. And Harriman later supported the Vietnam War as Under Secretary of State under the Lyndon Johnson administration. Uh, the Cold War, as we know, orchestrated by Harriman and others in the you know, big business and Wall Street were the primary drivers of this policy. Uh, this policy bred horrible human costs for humanity, uh, equivalent, as, as pointed out, to the genocide of the Native Indians and African slave trade. Uh, the Korean War alone uh, led to the deaths of one-tenth of the North Korean population and biblical devastation in North Korea resulting from the U.S bombing campaign. Uh, th there was a truth commission in South Korea revealed that U.S. allies committed six times more atrocities than the uh, North Koreans. Uh, it uh, pointed to uh, horrible atrocities from torture to the strafing of refugees. Uh, copious amounts of napalm were deployed. Uh, it, it was a truly a horrific war. A germ warfare may have also been deployed. And this foreshadowed the horrors of the Vietnam War. Uh, in fact, there's a new article in the New York Times uh, magazine today about Laos and the uh, residue of Agent Orange and the deformities uh, of children. Uh, so, you know, the human costs are just unconscionable of these wars and are felt generations later. Uh, and, you know, the Covert Action is, uh, you know, magazine uh, was founded by Phil Agee, who is a CIA whistleblower, who was aghast at the torture uh, being promoted uh, by U.S. clients and neo-Nazis in uh, Latin America. And it, you know, exposed uh, the crimes of the CIA uh, from assassinations to sponsoring torture and death squad regimes uh, around the world, as well as things like drug testing on unwitting suspects. Uh, as well as uh, appears the murder of U.S. whistleblowers such as De uh, Dr. Frank Olson, a CIA biochemist who threatened to expose germ warfare programs in the Korean War, was thrown from the 10th floor of a hotel in Midtown Manhattan after being beaten to death by two CIA thugs. Uh, this story only came to light a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, these crimes were all justified in the name of anti-communism and the Cold War and containing Russia. And, uh, you know, we have to be wary about uh, these kinds of excesses that will emerge today from the new Cold War. And let me end with two indicative quotes. Uh, one is by Linus Pauling. Uh, it was a brilliant scientist and Nobel laureate who says, and this uh, underscores the tragedy of uh, you know, uh, Henry Wallace and his removal from office. Uh, Paula said, who can say that, this, that what the world would have been like if Henry Wallace had remained vice president in 1944? There's a possibility that he could have been successful in averting the Cold War. There might have been no American involvement in the war in Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, or Laos. The military dictatorship sponsored by the US in many countries might have not come into existence. Tens of thousands of people who are now political prisoners, he was writing in 1970, uh, might have remained free. International treaties might have been made that would have saved the United States and Soviet Union hundreds of billions of dollars. We might have a better world today. 
And let me also uh, read a quote from Bernard Gordon, was a reader for Paramount Pictures, who underscores the point of Gorbachev that the Cold War made losers of us all. Uh, Bernard Gordon, a reader for Paramount Pictures, fired for his left-leaning views and author of Living in Interesting Times or How I Learned to Love the Blacklist, told an interviewer in 1997 that, quote, most people think about the terrible personal effects of McCarthyism, the ruined careers and lifetimes, even the deaths of people who were affected, all true enough and not to be slighted. Others think of the fear not only engendered in the entertainment industry in schools and universities and the press and the media, all true too. But my own sense goes beyond even that. I feel that the black period laid the groundwork for much that followed. The Nixon and Reagan regimes, which glorified the Cold War as a holy enterprise, which used the slogans of anti-communism to construct monstrous military machines that virtually bankrupted the country and placed the industrial military complex in such a powerful position that even today with the evil empire gone, there seems to be no way to stop the expenditures for arms and the export of arms. Eisenhower warned of this in his farewell address. But even beyond that, there's a sense that the convenient anti-communism has become anti-government with respect to all social programs that came out of the FDR era. The rich and powerful who grow more rich and powerful each day use blacklisting and McCarthyism to dismantle everything liberal, to make liberalism a dirty word, so that today both parties vie to be more reactionary. And these comments were made in 1997, but uh, they're certainly prescient having lived through the Trump years, uh, and perhaps the tide is starting to turn a bit given the disasters we've experienced. But I think you know the comment; those two comments should be heeded today, as we're you know very clearly repeating the follies of the past and embarking on a new Cold War. And events like the webinar we are part of today are extremely important, as we need to remember the first Cold War and its horrors and commemorate that history. Then we need to mobilize together, inspired by the legacy of Henry Wallace and other Cold War dissenters to resist this new Cold War so that we might, as Pauling suggested, have a better world in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> and you mentioned uh, Phil Agee and we have a surprise guest. He's not on the program, but uh, we have his son, Chris Agee here today, executive editor of Covert Action Magazine to give us a few lessons from his <clears throat> father. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Rachel, uh, Frank, all of you who put this event together and to all of you who have joined the webinar and uh, are watching online. Uh, my name is Chris Agee. I'm the executive editor of Covert Action Magazine and an adjunct professor at the City University of New York and the State University of New York. I'm also the son, as uh, Rachel mentioned, of, of Philip Agee, former CIA case officer and whistleblower who provided a firsthand expose of the Central Intelligence Agency. Let me just first say that as I registered for this, um, this webinar, I was asked uh, to join a Facebook group, which I did. And it said, do you have a family member or friend that has been affected by the Cold War? <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it upended my whole life. Um, you know, it also gave me a front seat onto the crimes of our era, as we have been discussing uh, we are all victims in many ways. Let me explain and describe a few significant lessons from my father, Philip Agee, um, uh, who taught me. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I thought I'd share those um, uh, principles around a, a couple of stories. The first is um, deb debunking the myth of the Cold War, understanding US plutocratic interests and third world revolutionary movements. The second principle was internationalism. Um, who can say no to international solidarity, right? And the third is political activism, um, keeping our eyes on the prize. All right, so what are we talking about here? Uh, back uh, in 1979, when I was um, starting high school, I was in a, uh, a history class and I was being told what, uh, what the uh, pol international political situation was. And the teacher um, was presenting these graphs, which he gave us like a flyer and it had two big bubbles. And one bubble said like the United States and the other bubble said like um, uh, the Soviet Union. And so he presented and, it, and, and the title was the bipolar model. And I took this home to my dad and I said, what the hell is this all about? And he said, okay, sit down, son, let me explain. All right, so he said, well, wait a minute, it's not that simple as these two models. 
but actually that um, oftentimes, for example, in cases like Angola, Iran, um, uh, places like um, you know, uh, uh, Guatemala, what had happened was that people were trying to struggle for um, their own uh, sovereignty and independence and access to their own resources. And, and so he gave me a, a, a book and he said, read this. I was 15 years old and it was called The People's History of the United States. So by all means, everybody grab that book if you haven't already. Howard Zinn wrote it, A People's History of the United And since then my life changed. Um, from then on, I, then on in that class, I became the class dissident and organized um, the students in my class to, to take on the official narrative. Uh, this was part of many lessons from my father. Another one involved a summer job, for example. He gave me between my high school and sophomore year, my high school sophomore year, he, said, he asked me to organize the umpteen filing cabinets of newspaper clippings on, on my father. And, and, by, and I couldn't believe it as I was pulling them all out. You know, it, was a, it was sort of a boring summer job, but the entire room was filled with all these clippings about how my father was drunk and despondent KGB double agent trader, all of that sort of stuff. And I was like sitting in the living room with my, you know, my father. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, he, he's, a, uh, uh, he's all these things. And so the propaganda campaign against people who stand up against uh, these, the, the Cold War myth and all of these issues is, is truly uh, uh, gargantuan. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, the U.S. I, I became to learn that the U.S. that U.S. foreign foreign policy actually serves the plutocratic elite and their efforts. And so I began. I came to learn that the Cold War myth serves the following purposes: to distract the masses from imperial strategies, to justify huge military budgets for geopolitical control, all for the purpose of securing cheap access to raw materials, cheap access to labor, international markets for corporate interests, and then, and then ultimately to oppress efforts to build truly democratic societies, politically, economically, and socially. The examples are endless. Iran, Guatemala, Vietnam, Chile, Angola, Nicaragua. You, you know, just to mention the few during, during, that, during uh, the middle of the uh, last century. And so what we have is um, an imperialist strategy that by the way, did not begin with the Cold War as we have mentioned uh, various times during this, uh, these testimonies, but goes back to the founding of this country. Uh, read a book by William Bloom called Killing Hope. Um, and um, so uh, an another story, for example, if you just take a look at my father's works, you can see that uh, when, for example, he was stationed in Uruguay uh, as a CIA case officer, while he was told when he was recruited that he was going to be building freedom and democracy for the rest of the world, um, he, he found that what he was actually doing was like rounding up dis, uh, dissidents, like human rights activists, labor rights activists, and he would meet with the, uh, regularly with the chief of police. And um, at one point, the chief of police says to him, hey, uh, you know, um, you know, as, as he's meeting with him, he's hearing these sounds of screaming going on uh, in the background. And he's saying to the chief of police, hey, Hefe, what's, what's that sound? Uh, what's, uh, who's that screaming? And he goes, oh, Philip, Felipe, don't you remember? Those are the people who you gave us last week. Okay, so he started to realize that the work that he was doing was, he was really acting as, as a secret policeman for international, a multinational corporate interest. Mm -hmm. So the second, uh, lesson that he taught me was a very basic one called international solidarity, internationalism. And, and you know, what, who could say no to being friends with people around the world? Okay, so he said, hey, you wanna come to Cuba? I was 13 years old and had a skateboard. And um, I said, sure. And I went to Cuba via uh, East Berlin, by the way, it's a long story. But um, I ended up finding that uh, people were very interested in, uh, in being friends and developing a society that that, that, that um, prioritize friendship with all peoples, food, shelter, clothing, education, and healthcare as a national priority and anti-imperialism and self-determination. So you can go through the examples with, re with respect to Cuba and how the United States has tried to destroy that um, uh, effort to, to build that stuff. Video next. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, and then, and so like, for example, one of the jobs that my father had as a CIA agent was 
to um, literally put a, 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 an incri a incriminating message into a tooth toothpaste tube and plant it on a Cuban diplomat and get that diplomat taken into custody. I mean, so this is the kind of stuff that, you know, when you go into the details uh, and you figure that stuff out. Um, so lastly, uh, there are many more stories to tell. My time has run out. Um, I would simply sit, say that um, we are doing the best we can to uh, continue the work of my father. We've relaunched Covert Action. Read it. Um, uh, share it and um, get involved. And um, we'd, we'd be very, very happy to, uh, if anyone wants to write for us, for example, or even get involved and help, that would be great. So ultimately what he taught me was educate yourself about these things, educate those around you and get involved. That's what we need to do to, to have an impact on all of this stuff that we're talking about. Anyway, thank you very Chris. much. Yes, thank you. I just want to say to Chris, your father is a big hero of mine. I went to Cuba in 2000, I got to meet him. <laughs> at his travel agency. He's in my film when I learned up U.S. foreign policy. And you mentioned two other heroes of mine, Howard Zinn and William Bloom. And thanks for your presentation, Chris. Um, I'm gonna now introduce uh, my friend, Michael Novick. Uh, it's, he's gonna, it's a taped presentation he'll be making. He's a, Mike is a longtime uh, anti-racist activist. He edits and publishes Turning the Tide. And he's on the production crew of Changelink, which is the LA community calendar. And he's a second generation union shop steward and is currently chair of the KPFK local station board. And Mike does Michael does so many things. This is Michael Novick speaking um, on behalf of Anti-Racist Action and for the uh, Cold War Conference. I wanted to speak briefly about even the term Cold War, um, which in my understanding is uh, part of US terminology. It goes along with the phrase uh, Iron Curtain uh, from the period uh, of the uh, late 40s, 50s, into the 60s. Uh, and uh, that terminology, of course, was about stereotyping the uh, socialist bloc of Eastern Europe, Russia, uh, later China, Vietnam, as uh, forces of evil. You know, later the term the axis of evil was used. But um, the uh, Soviets used the term a uh, peaceful coexistence for that same period of time. They were trying to live in peace with the West, despite the ideological and material contradictions between socialism and capitalism. Uh, so I think it's instructive that really to this day we use that terminology because the terminology of Cold War comes out of uh, the US, which is a, a warmongering country. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the roots of that Cold War and the long history of war in the United States. The United States invaded Cuba, for example, um, before the Soviet Union existed and before Fidel Castro was born. You can see his picture up there on my wall. Uh, the United States uh, invaded uh, Nicaragua long before the Sandinistas uh, came to power. They wanted to uh, uh, defeat Sandino himself in the 1920s. Uh, so uh, the U.S. has been at war with many, many peoples over a long period of time, starting with settler colonialism. And I think the term Cold War comes out of that history of warfare. Uh, the other aspect I wanted to talk about is that the um, uh, Red Scare and the Red Baiting, which was an intense part of the Cold War, is an attempt to uh, identify uh, forces of uh, resistance and forces uh, opposed to imperialism, colonialism, capitalism inside the United States as well as internationally. Uh, and so there were purges of so-called communists. And um, But I think an important part of the so-called Red Scare was actually a Black Scare. And again, you see the picture of Malcolm uh, up on my wall and uh, Lumia here in my shirt. And I think that the Black uh, freedom struggle has been a key part always of the attempt to transform this society in a positive direction, uh, going back to the days of slavery and settler colonialism. And that uh, the key charge against the communists is that they were uh, lovers of black people. They didn't use the term black people in that term. And so some of the main victims of uh, the Red Scare were actually black people. And so Paul Robeson or uh, W.B. Du Bois uh, and so on were of people being targeted, and even some of the uh, communists who were jailed uh, were African American. Uh, so I think those are important things to keep in mind. Uh, the the roots of what we call the Cold War 
in U.S. colonialism, U.S. imperialism, U.S. war making, uh, U.S. racism. And, um, you know, Noam Chomsky, I think, has talked about the uh, power of a, a positive or the danger of a positive example. I think that uh, the construct of the Cold War was a way for the U.S. to justify its intervention in the uh, former uh, colonial world that was seeking independence uh, from, um, you know, its prior colonial masters, the British, French, uh, sometimes the German. Uh, empire, the Italians who invaded Ethiopia, uh, the Japanese, and and in those struggles against colonialism and imperialism, uh, Vietnam struggled against uh, the French and against the Japanese, the Chinese themselves struggled against Japanese uh, incursions. Uh, the U.S. stepped in uh, in what Malcolm X referred to as a, a lateral pass from the uh, European imperial powers in particular and uh, use the uh, excuse of the Cold War, the excuse of a global struggle with uh, godless communism and uh, with the Soviet Union as the pretext for uh, intervention and invasion, uh, for assassination, for example, of Patrice Lumumba uh, in the Congo uh, and many other subsequent independence leaders in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, for military intervention, because it was pretty hot, obviously, during a lot of the Cold War uh, in Korea, uh, in Vietnam, and in many other places in the world. And uh, all of that is still around. It's still happening. The, uh, the parties might change in power. Um, you know, we've seen the Democratic Party oust uh, uh, Trump uh, and take command of the... Uh, uh, executive branch and s slim control of both houses of Congress, uh, and yet they pass enormous uh, military budgets, they authorize uh, the use of military force, or they use military force without authorization if they have to. And um, so I think that's the context of the so-called New Cold War. The New Cold War is targeting, uh, in particular, uh, China, which is uh, much more disruptive of the international capitalist uh, hegemonic order than uh, Donald Trump could ever uh, pretend or imagine to be uh, because they have elements still of socialism within their society and they are a billion plus people uh, who are not uh, integrated into white supremacy, not well integrated into capitalism and imperialism and therefore they represent uh, a threat to the hegemony of the U.S. And so we're seeing uh, the drumbeats uh, from both sides of the political aisle again. Um, Trump launched the trade war against China, but Biden is in and he's uh, pursuing uh, a military encirclement. Uh, they have a new thing called the Quad. It's a alliance between uh, the United States, India, uh, Australia, and Japan, uh, directly targeted at China. And so I think we have to be on the alert, not just for this new Cold War, but for the potential hot war that it represents, because all of these are aspects of war making for imperial ambition and a wounded and uh, threatened U.S. empire, which we're seeing now we live in, uh, is particularly dangerous. Thank you um, <clears throat> for uh, Michael Novick's video. And we are now going to hear from uh, Alice Slater will provide testimony. She serves on the boards of World Beyond War and Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. She is the UN NGO representative for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and works with Code Pink for a world at peace. I'm delighted to be here and I'm so overwhelmed by all this information. And I'm just thinking, what? Are, how are we going to use this and if only everybody in America knows what we're listening to now, I think we could shift the whole conversation because what we're getting now is they're, they're heating it up. I mean, Biden is calling Putin a, uh, a criminal. He's agreeing he's criminal. And uh, we, we had this terrible meeting with China. And I grew up in the 50s when we had the Red Scare and we had a, uh, a comic strip by Walt Kelly called Pogo. 
And his most famous line was, we've met the enemy and he is us. And I was so terrified of communism. I mean, I remember being at Queens College in the 1950s and we're having the discussion and somebody gave me a pamphlet that said Communist Party of America. My heart was pounding with terror. I put it in my book bag. I went home in the Bronx up to the eighth floor to the incinerator, threw it directly down the incinerator without even looking. That's how scared we were. And years later, I did go to the Soviet Union when Gorbachev had instituted perestroika and glasnost. I was part of a legal delegation, the Lawyers Alliance for Nuclear Arms Control. And we were going there. Actually, the Soviets had stopped nuclear testing ahead of us. And Congress said, uh, we went to Congress, our lawyers group. They said, oh, forget it. You can't trust the Russians. So we raised the head of our New York City Bar Association, Bill DeWind. He was part of the Dutch DeWinds up the Hudson, raised a lot of money, hired a team of seismologists. We went to the Soviet Union. We said, will you let us put our seismologists at your test site so we can see if you really stopped? And they said, yes. And we were able to go back to Congress and stop nuclear testing. So, I mean, it is possible to get progress. And I looked at this, like I was shocked when I looked at the history that Woodrow Wilson sent troops as we heard. And then after we dropped the bomb and we got together with the Soviet Union to form the United Nations to end the scourge of war, that was our mission. And the number one resolution was the nuclear disarmament. Stalin said to Truman, turn the bomb over to the UN. And Truman said, no, so Russia got the bomb. Then when the war came down and Gorbachev let go of all of Eastern Europe without a shot, I mean, it was like a miracle. Uh, he and Reagan met in Reykjavik and they said, let's get rid of all the nuclear weapons. We now have 14,000 nuclear weapons on the planet and 13,000 are in the US and Russia. So this is not just some abstraction and 2,500 in each country pointed on missiles ready to go off. The, the other uh, seven countries have only a thousand between them. And China's smart enough to keep the bombs off the missiles. They don't point them at anybody. So China has a little Eastern wisdom there. Anyway, Gorbachev said to Reagan, let's get rid of all the nuclear weapons. Reagan said, great idea. So Gorbachev said, don't do Star Wars because the US has a military policy to dominate and control the military use of space. It's in their documents. That's what we stand for. And Reagan said, I can't give up Star Wars. So Gorbachev pulled it off the table. Then uh, he was very nervous, Gorbachev, about Germany becoming reunited because as we've heard, they lost 27 million Russians to the Nazi onslaught. I never heard that figure. As a matter of fact, when I went there in the 80s, every guy over 60 was wearing his World War II medals. You go to the Leningrad Cemetery at that time, now in St. Petersburg, there were like 400,000 mass graves from the Nazi siege of Leningrad. And uh, every street corner had a monument to the dead. And my guide said to me, we had guides, he said, why don't you Americans trust us? And I was being very arrogant American. Why don't we trust you? I said, what about Hungary? What about Czechoslovakia? He looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, we had to protect our border from Germany. And I looked at him and that was their truth. And we were getting such baloney, the American people, and they're still getting it. You know, we, they were never coming after us. I mean, their occupation might not have been the finest occupation of Eastern Europe, but they weren't gonna let anybody come into Russia. I mean, Napoleon had marched in a hundred years earlier into Moscow. So anyway, it was, uh, then so Gorbachev said uh, he was very nervous about East Germany being united with West Germany and going into NATO. And Reagan said, don't worry. And Jack Matlock, his ambassador, has written an op-ed in the New York Times about this. We give you our word, we will not expand NATO one inch to the east. And they put it right up to Russia's border. They were even talking about taking Ukraine in and Georgia. 
and we're doing war games on Russia's border, nuclear war games. We keep US nukes in five NATO states, Italy, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and Turkey. I mean, it's, you know what happened when they had them in Cuba, we went bananas. And that's very interesting to me, the Cuban Missile Crisis, because we, Kennedy made a deal with Khrushchev to get them out and secretly promised to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey a year later because he couldn't make it a public deal because the Congress never would have agreed to it. And he kept his word, he removed them. But we had put them in there. That was part of the incentive for Khrushchev to put missiles into Cuba. And guess what? We now have missiles back in Turkey, right on Russia's border with nuclear weapons based there. So Pogo was right. Then after uh, we went west, Clinton bombed Kosovo. That's the first time we broke our agreement with the United Nations that we would never engage in a war of aggression unless we were under imminent threat of attack without the approval of the Security Council. And Russia vetoed that war, and we went in and said, the hell with you. Then Putin offered Clinton to cut our massive arsenals at that time with 16,000 down to 1,000 each and call everybody to the table, but don't put missiles into Romania because we were starting to build these missile emplacements. Clinton would not promise this. And then Bush walked out of the 1972 anti-ballistic missile treaty that we had with the Soviets, which helped us to stop building more missiles because we didn't have anti-missiles. And uh, we put missiles in Romania and Trump put them in Poland. And uh, this is, it's, it's always us. Then they, uh, Bush and Obama blocked any discussion in 2008 and 2014 on a Russian and Chinese proposals for a space weapons ban in the Committee on Disarming Geneva, you need consensus from everybody to discuss it. The US vetoed it. And every year there's a resolution in the uh, General Assembly, prevention of an arms race now the space, Russia and uh, China propose it and support it. And the US says, no, we, and now we formed a separate space force, masters in space, you know, then, this was very interesting because we're hearing all this talk about cyber attacks after the Stuxnet virus, where the U.S. and Israel boasted about how they, um, you know, hit uranium enrichment facilities in Iran. Putin proposed to Obama that the U.S. and Russia negotiate a cyber ban treaty. Doesn't that sound good? No. We, we turned it down and there's a story in the Times. And then, I mean, they were having this 75th anniversary of World War II in, in, in Europe and they did not invite Russia. And uh, Putin gave this speech saying that neglecting the lessons of history inevitably leads to a harsh payback. We will firmly uphold the truth based on documented historical facts we will continue to be honest and impartial about the events of World War II. This includes a large scale project to establish Russia's largest collection of archival records, film, photo materials about the history of World War II and the pre-war period. And I think we have a good partner over there in Putin. If we wanna do a truth report, we should make it like we should get more Russians involved with us. It shouldn't just be Americans. It should, because they want to do it, you know. And even the new arms race, Putin gave a speech in, uh, I think it was 2018 uh, or 17, how they begged us not to walk out of that anti-ballistic missile treaty. And then they tried so hard to negotiate. And finally, they decided they had to improve their weapons. And then we use that as an excuse for why we're spending more money in an arms race. And of course, we've heard all these economic drivers, and it's insane because we have so much to do for the climate. I mean, look at Texas. They need a whole new grid. We're looking for jobs and, and manufacturers. I mean, they let a, a, a snowstorm kill all the electric in Texas. You know, we need windmills. We need solar power. We we need to change our farming over. There's so much work that we could be doing for this incredible money 
that we're spending on the military. So right now we got a treaty negotiated with 122 countries that just got disgusted with the nuclear weapon states that weren't following their promises in the non-proliferation treaty for good faith efforts and nuclear disarmament. So they, but there's no treaty that actually said nuclear weapons are illegal. So we negotiated that, it passed, we won the Nobel Peace Prize for this international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. None of the nuclear weapon states were there. Interestingly, North Korea voted for the negotiations in the UN, they were the only nuclear weapon state that did like uh, the Western states, US, Russia, England, France, and Israel voted no. India, China, and Pakistan abstained. And North Korea voted yes. This was like the first vote whether negotiations should go forward. And then they went forward and we got a treaty and it just became, entered into force because there more than 50 countries. And so that's something that we should be promoting here. And uh, I mean, we have to get Obama to, to, we really have to get him to change his tune. We got him to change his tune on the big economic uh, uh, bill they just passed. You know, that wasn't his love from an old Leo liberal, which got us Trump in the first place. So uh, there's like a new talk somehow of, uh, that's, we're not there yet, but. We have to mobilize here and uh, I'm working with World Beyond War. I mean, it's no good to just stop this war or that weapon. We have to get rid of the whole war system. And now with the plague and the climate catastrophe and the nuclear weapons pointed, ready to destroy, you know, we have to shift out of war. So I recommend everybody to do the World Beyond War and the ICANN campaign where you can work to get the US, they should definitely stop any kind of manufacturer and all the arms controllers that destroy the message or so they're now talking about no first use, which is ridiculous because we're using them already just by having them. Dan Ellsberg always says that. It's like a, if a bank robber walks into a bank with a gun, you don't have to shoot it, you're already using it and we're using them. So that's how they came up after this whole new treaty to ban the bomb, we now have all the, foundations in America that are part of the military and the Mickey Mac that McGovern calls it, you know, military industrial academic congressional think tank complex is now pushing no first use, which doesn't mean anything. So ban the bomb and, you know, let's, let's get the message out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And I think you have a, you've mentioned a project uh, U.S. Russia collaboration on a truth commission. So, <laughs> yes, probably a good well, project. This is the opening shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on. Thank you, Alice. And Frank is going to introduce our uh, next speaker, giving testimony as we continue to put the U.S. Cold War on trial. Frank. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Alice. It's my privilege to uh, introduce Norman Solomon. Uh, Norman is the national director of Roots Action and the author of many books, including War Made Easy. <laughs> How the Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death. And it was made into a really important anti-war film narrated by Sean Penn and also Norman uh, narrates it too. One of my favorite anti-war films. Norman was a Bernie Sanders delegate from California uh, uh, to the 2016 and 2020 Democratic National Conventions. And Norman is the founder and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy. And uh, here's Norman Solomon. Hey, thanks to everybody who's been making this wonderful commission event possible. Um, I'm speaking on this topic, why so many progressives joined in with the Russiagate frenzy, which I would date to uh, the last five years, basically, and it ain't over, as we've seen in the last several days. I just saw in the chat a few minutes ago, somebody wrote, Putin is no hero, but Biden has no standing to call him a killer. Um, I also don't know that Biden has a theological background to uh, pronounce whether uh, Putin has a soul, but that's sort of a side note. If you think about the last five years, just guesstimate how many airtime minutes on MSNBC Rachel Maddow devoted to Russiagate and talking about the evils of Russia compared to the number of airtime minutes talking about the dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Uh, the study has been done, but I would be sure that the ratio is thousands to one. 
And that tells us a lot about the US mass media coverage of issues between the United States and Russia and really how badly, extremely out of whack and dangerous the coverage is. The reality is, I mean, if we, if we look at uh, from 2016 to this moment, there is a vast number of people who call themselves progressives, including many who have described themselves as anti-war peace-oriented people who were to a very large extent on the Russiagate train, villainizing the Russian government villainizing Putin, blaming Russia for fundamental flaws in the 2016 election and in the lack of democracy in the United States. And this has had profound and huge impacts that carry forward to this day and are very ominous and frankly could contribute to um, an eventual uh, nuclear holocaust. So I think it's very important to ask ourselves, how could so many progressives be on board with a line of propaganda that increases the chances of nuclear war. Uh, there's certainly a lot of factors. There's not in my 10 minutes really uh, enough time to really go, go into them, but certainly, yes, uh, there was sort of an enemy of my enemy is my friend counterpart where if Trump was doing X and uh, war hawks like Adam Schiff were saying Y, then because Trump was so awful, then people would start to identify with a war hawk like Adam Schiff and not see the implications. And what are the implications? I think that's a question yeah. that the admirers of Rachel Maddow and countless other uh, Russiagate enthusiasts in media, uh, these are implications that just are never or have rarely been explored to the end point. The end point is that what is the final foreseeable result of continuing to bang on the anti-Russia drum? And as the uh, person who wrote in the chat said, and I certainly agree, uh, you know, Putin's no hero. I'm not holding him up as some great peace advocate. I think uh, an examination of the record shows the United States, as Alice has pointed out in the last couple of decades, the United States has been much more at fault in escalating the nuclear arms race. But uh, you know, Putin's no saint, but that's not the point. The point is that Russia and the United States have more than 90% of the nuclear weapons on this planet. The point is that the end point, the foreseeable end point of the Russiagate frenzy and all this anti-Russia stuff that is over the top in the news media, often at least through silence, aided and abetted by groups that say they're for peace and disarmament. The end point is that we move closer and closer to diplomatic, rhetorical, geopolitical, and yes, military conflict between the United States and Russia. So it's like the equivalent of the CEO uh, of a huge corporation that doesn't want to think past the next quarter or two. It's people who think, well, you know, we didn't like Trump, so we'll use this against Trump. And now it's, well, we've got to support Biden on all of this uh, denunciation of Russia because, well, we support Biden. It makes no friggin' sense at all. It's just buying into a mass media and political establishment gravy train that helps the military industrial complex to make the sale for more and more weapons, keep the Pentagon military budget higher and higher. Uh, this is the agenda. And we've got to make sure that not only do we not buy into it, but that in the days, weeks, and months ahead, uh, peace and disarmament and generally progressive groups stop being part of that problem, either by somehow echoing the mass media now Biden administration line or by silence. And let's talk about silence. I mean, you can make a list of dozens and dozens into the hundreds of groups, uh, national, regional, local, that are peace oriented uh, and sincerely we want to assume are trying to bring about disarmament and peace. And you click down that list and then assess how many of them challenge the Russiagate narrative that the Kremlin has been and continues to be this mortal threat to democracy, implicitly more than the Koch brothers, more than Wall Street, more than the military contractors. I mean, it's, it's preposterous and yet it's been ratified 
uh, in effect, if not actively, at least in silence, by the vast majority of that list you would have made of groups. So, you know, I, I'm very glad that uh, me and my colleagues at rootsaction.org have been challenging that uh, narrative from the beginning actively, uh, as well as my colleagues at the Institute for Public Accuracy. I know there are other groups that have been doing that actively uh, in the last five years, uh, but we have a tremendous amount of work to do uh, to, in solidarity, challenge many activists and groups that even today are either agreeing with uh, implicitly or being silent about uh, what the Biden administration is doing, uh, the pronouncements, the saber rattling towards Russia and China. And so we've got not only Biden who is uh, saying, reaffirming his assessment, his theological assessment that Putin has no soul, but also that he's a, a killer uh, as though somebody who supported uh, the Iraq war can go around preaching about being a killer. Uh, but we also have Antony Blinken, who by the way, was supported by some peace and disarmament groups quite avidly to be secretary of state when he was nominated. He's going off and threatening China, going to Alaska and beyond to say that uh, China is a huge threat. So as the saying goes, we, we've seen this movie before, we know where it is headed and where it is headed uh, unless we can avert it is further war, further catastrophe, and unfortunately, a great possibility of thermonuclear war. And so I just wanna close by saying that we have an opportunity uh, to, as the saying goes, do a reset. That maybe the last few days can be a useful shock uh, to those who didn't wanna talk about what was wrong with the Russiagate narrative. Didn't wanna talk about uh, the anti-Russia frenzy, but we have to talk about it. We have to challenge it because that's what peacemaking is all about. Thank you so much, uh, Norman. S such important testimony and, you know, uh, leading to an action that tomorrow's Monday again, and if you weren't here earlier, let's contact Congress. I mean, you know, this, this, Truth Commission is happening just at a time when heightened tensions, awareness, fear. And so maybe, you know, it's time that we can say that we were at this webinar. We can send the links to our representatives. And if um, anyone is truly sincere about January 6th and, and fear as they are, you know, in Congress, that true, you know, fear, um, then let's let them know that this is no accident. It's a pattern.